So I have the uh, distinct pleasure of talking about surgical management of stone disease. So I'm, my intent here is to try to keep you awake for the next 20 minutes. Um, there are some questions that I have inserted into the presentation, so hopefully that we're not necessarily audience participation, but it'll be uh, drive you to stay awake and kind of pay attention. Um, this is, of course, based on the AOA guidelines. The outline is to talk about observation of renal calculi, treatment of ureteral stones, management of renal stones, urolithiasis during pregnancy, and uh, role of open surgery. As I mentioned, uh, this is based on the most recent AUA Endourology Society guidelines published in 2016. So what about the asymptomatic calocele stone? Uh, these are usually small stones, non-uric acid. I think it's reasonable, as we all know, to consider um, just uh, watchful waiting, monitoring. Uh, the, we would consider intervention in these small stones for children, uh, those with a solitary kidney, pilots, and women considering pregnancy. What's the risk of observation? If you look at what the symptomatic episode or need for intervention is over time, it's about 10% per year. Five-year cumulative risk is about 48.5%. There is data to support observation for lower pole stones up to one centimeter. Uh, this is a paper by Keeley who looked at calocele stones uh, up to 1.5 centimeters. It was a randomized study between shockwave and observation. Mean follow-up was 2.2 years. And there was no difference in stone-free rates, need for additional treatment, or visits to a primary care doctor. So shockwave did not improve the stone-free rate or the clinical outcome. So that's just observation of uh, renal stones. Let's switch to ureteral stones. So as we all know, uh, observation is the number one choice, especially for stones under a centimeter. Uh, when they're unilateral, not uric acid, you have a normal contralateral renal function, symptoms are controlled, and there's no clinical evidence of sepsis. Observation, uh, medium probability of passage. If a stone is up to about five millimeters, it's about 68%, and between five and one centimeter, about 47%. The role of medical expulsive therapy, the panel found that alpha blockers provide a statistically significant improvement in stone passage and that alpha blockers are superior to nifedipine. So the recommendations then for stones up to one centimeter in the ureter is observation, um, uh, medical uh, expulsive therapy, and periodic evaluation. The majority of stones will pass in four to six weeks if they pass. The guidelines then, patients with uncomplicated ureteral stones up to a centimeter should be offered observation, and those with distal stones of similar size should be offered met with alpha blockers, and this is both for adult and pediatric patients. If you have someone that fails observation, uh, indications for treatment, persistent obstruction, failure for stone progression, unremitting colic, or larger stones. Contraindications to treatment is bacteria, so I think this is the key uh, take home, obviously appropriate antibiotic therapy before intervention, if you have someone who's septic with obstruction, then urgent decompression. I don't think there's any um, consensus on whether stenting or perk is um, one better than the other. Uh, treatment is delayed until the infection is cleared and following a complete course of an appropriate antibiotics. The guidelines then, both S-wall and ureteroscopy are acceptable first-line therapies for um, stones in the ureter. Ureteroscopy is best for stones greater than a centimeter. Routine stenting is not recommended as part of ESWL and stenting following uncomplicated ureteroscopy is optional. What about a percutaneous approach to a, ure a ureteral stone? That's reasonable if you have a large impacted ureteral stone. The ureteral stone is associated with renal stone, so you're going after both. In patients, obviously, with a urinary diversion, so you don't have uh, access from below, and failed retrograde approach. So if you look at the, uh, the most, I think one of the biggest findings in the uh, 2016 guidelines is there's a swing more towards ureteroscopy and away from shockwave, both for ureters and for the kidney. And the only place that doesn't change is in the pediatric population. So if we look at the, um, the recommendations, clinicians should perform, um, should inform patients that shockwave is the procedure with the least morbidity and the lowest complication rate, but ureteroscopy has a greater stone-free rate in a single procedure. In patients with mid or distal ureteral stones who require intervention, clinicians should recommend ureteroscopy as first line therapy. For patients who decline ureteroscopy, then S wall is reasonable. Ureteroscopy is recommended for patients with suspected cysteine or uric acid stones because most likely they will fail ESWL and who fail uh, expulsive therapy. Clinicians should offer ureteroscopy or shockwave for pediatrics. So that's the difference. Here's a question. 42-year-old male with a mildly symptomatic 3-millimeter ureteral stone with hydro confirmed by CT scan four weeks ago. What would you do? CT scan, stent, or ureteroscopy? The answer is CT scan. So nearly all ureteral stones less than 4 millimeters will pass. Further assessment of the stone is indicated. Soon is sufficient time. It had been four weeks for stone passage, and there's no definitive evidence that a procedure is indicated at this stage. 
Question two, a 36-year-old female who's afebrile with severe right flank pain, your analysis demonstrates pyuria and microhematuria. A non-contrast CT scan de demonstrates right perinephric fluid and right hydronephrosis down to a distal three millimeter stone. What would you do next? Stent, perk, or medical management? Nah, the Italians get it wrong. You can't f So the recommendation, these are all from, these are SAS uh, questions. Foreign seal extravasation is often associated with a small distal uterine stone. Th these patients should not be treated any differently than other stone patients. Intervention is indicated only for fever, fever nausea, vomiting, unrelenting, unrelenting pain. The AUA guidelines clearly state that a period of observation awaiting spontaneous <coughs> passage is appropriate. Question three, a 55-year-old diabetic woman stented three months earlier for an obstructed <coughs> ureteral calculus is scheduled for uteroscopy and laser lithotripsy. A preoperative urinalysis reveals yeast and it's confirmed by a catheterized specimen. So do you treat or do you reschedule surgery, I'm sorry, treat and um, proceed or do you reschedule surgery and proceed after cultured negative um, uh, clearance of the fungaria? Yeah, so the answer is C. Suspected UTI should be treated prior to uteroscopic stone treatment and surgery performed only after culture documented clear, uh, clearance of the pathogen. Question four, the best treatment for a symptomatic 1.5 centimeter proximal ureteral stone is shock, stent shock, ureteroscopy or perk? So the answer is ureteroscopy. So both shockwave and ureteroscopy are acceptable first line therapies but ureteroscopy is probably better for stones that are greater than one centimeter and I already mentioned the indications for percutaneous approach. Let's switch our attention now to a stone in the kidney. Management is based on three decision points, size, location, and composition. So stones that are greater than two centimeters, PERC has an excellent success rate, about 95%. If you look at shock wave success for stones that are less than two centimeters, it varies between 65 and 75%. And the success obviously decreases with increasing size of the stone. It also decreases with location as well. Let's talk about lower pole stones. This is a lower pole study that Albala published in 2001. And it was a prospective randomized trial of uh, shockwave versus PERC for lower pole stones. They randomized 60 patients to PERC, 68 to shockwave. And the stone free rate for shockwave uh, for stones greater than one centimeter was only 21%. So percutaneous for calculi greater than one centimeter is probably a recommendation we'll see in a minute. This is an interesting paper from um, Clayman, and what they looked at was the impact of lower pole radiographic anatomy. So negative predictors of success with shockwave. So one was the infundibular pelvic angle. So if that angle is less than 90 degrees, so now the, you can see the calyx is below the, of course the ureter stones would have a difficult time, fragmented stones from getting out. If the infundibular, make sure this is showing up, infundibular length is greater than three centimeters, or if the infundibular width is less than five millimeters. In their study, they found there was only a 17% success with shockwave for calculi up to 1.5 centimeters if any of the three were present in the patient. What about composition? Cysteine and brushite and calcium oxalate monohydrate stones are resistant to fragmentation by a shock wave. Stones greater than 1,000 Hounsfield units require a significantly greater number of shocks. And this is an algorithm for lower pole stones that uh, Peggy Pearl had put together that I think summarizes the guidelines very well for us. So you have a lower pole stone. If it's less than a centimeter and the patient's asymptomatic, observation is reasonable. If the patient ha is symptomatic, then you want to look at the patient. What is the Hounsfield units? Is it a soft stone or a hard stone? What's the skin to stone distance? So is a, you know, is it is a shock wave going to work because will the shock actually get there? And does the patient have favorable lower pole anatomy? So if the answer is yes to that, then shock wave is reasonable. However, if the stone is hard, patient uh, is large, or there's unfavorable lower pole anatomy, ureteroscopy is reasonable. For the one to two centimeter stone, you can actually consider ureteroscopy, especially if there's, if PERC is contraindicated, percutaneous is reasonable, and then if you have stones larger than two centimeters, probably percutaneous nephrostolosotomy. <coughs> so the guidelines for 2016, clinicians should offer shockwave or ureteroscopy in patients with symptomatic uh, stones, lower pole stones, uh, less than one centimeter. They should, they should not offer shockwave as first line therapy in patients with stones in the lower pole that are greater than a centimeter and they should, they should inform patients with lower pole stones that are greater than a centimeter in size that PERC has the highest uh, stone free rate and a greater morbidity. What are the negative predictors of shockwave? Stone related, so it's the burden, how much stone do you have, the location, i.e. lower pole versus upper pole, and then the density. Renal related, so intrarenal anatomy, as I already mentioned, kind of that, uh, the lower pole anatomy. 
drainage. So not only is the lower pole affected by drainage, but think about a high insertion of a ureter for a horseshoe kidney. That would also impede the passage of stone fragments. And then um, related to uh, BMI. Contraindications to shock wave, pregnancy, uncorrected coagulopathy, urinary tract obstruction, infection, renal artery or aortic aneurysm, and morbid obesity. The complications associated with shock waves are parenchymal bleeding, usually managed conservatively, transfuse is indicated, um, excluding a clotting abnormality, age is a risk factor twofold per, per, decade, per decade for um, bleeding due to shock wave. What are the long-term effects of shock wave? Acute hemorrhagic lesion can lead to a scar, decreased renal functional volume, subcapsular hematoma can be long-lasting. Prospective studies have indicated that elderly patients are at an increased risk of hypertension, and there's data to suggest an association being between shock wave and both diabetes and hypertension. Hypertension related to the uh, effect on the kidney, diabetes thought to be secondary to the impact of the pancreas. These are again very low, theoretical to a certain extent. Decreased shock wave induced injury, how can you minimize this, the injury? Brief pause following initiation of treatment and slow the shock wave firing rate. What are the indications for a perk for a renal stone? Staghorn calculi, renal stones greater than two centimeters, lower pole stones greater than a centimeter, cysteine or calcium oxalate monohydrate, and systems with poor dependent drainage, as I mentioned, a horseshoe kidney. So the AUA guidelines, again, you're gonna see that there, there's a move away from uh, shockwave being basically used for everything. So in symptomatic patients with a total non-lower pole stone burden of less than 20 or less than two centimeters, clinicians may offer shockwave or ultrasound both in the adult and in the pediatric patient. In symptomatic adult patients with a total renal stone burden greater than 20 uh, millimeters, clinicians should offer PERC as the first line therapy. In adult patients with a total renal stone burden greater than two centimeters, clinicians should not offer shockwave uh, as a first line therapy. And in the pediatric patient with a total renal stone burden greater than two centimeters, here again, there's an exception. Both PERC and shockwave are acceptable. So I gave you the answer on that one. Uh, the stone composition most resistant to fragmentation with shockwave therapy is calcium oxalate monohydrate. The fragility of stones determines their ability to be fractured with therapies such as shockwave and will affect the outcome of therapy. Calcium oxalate monohydrate, brushite, and cysteine stones have been shown to be the least fragile and are less likely to respond to therapy with shockwave. So question six, hopefully you'll remember this from two seconds ago. 34-year-old male with a horseshoe kidney has a symptomatic 1.7 centimeter left lower pole calcial stone. The next step is shock, ureteroscopy, or perk. Yep, all right. Okay, so someone's listening. Uh, symptomatic lower calcial stones clear poorly after fragmentation of shock wave, especially in horseshoe kidneys due to the high insertion and the poor dependent drainage. Ureteroscopic stone fragmentation extraction can be difficult, and perks can be performed safely and is the most optimal route to render the patient stone free. Question seven, the predominant renal histologic change noted in experimental studies after shock wave is, The Italians? No? Good. You made up for the other error. So, S wall results in, I, I know him well, it's okay. I, S wall results in acute disruption of the diminutive arcuate veins and result in interstitial hemorrhage within the focal area of the shock wave. As the acute injury resolves, a focus of interstitial fibrosis develops. This area of damage usually accounts for well under 1% of the total functional area of the kidney. So, question eight. A decrease in renal injury with shockwave can be accomplished by starting at a low energy setting, starting at a low energy setting and pausing for three to four minutes before increasing the energy setting, starting at a low shockwave firing rate and pausing for three to four minutes before increasing the shockwave firing rate. B. So the power level of the priming dose is not the factor responsible for the protection from injury from shockwave. The inclusion of a three to four minute pause following the priming dose is protective, while increasing the power setting without this delay may not result in reduced injury. Increasing the shockwave firing rate would increase the renal injury incurred. So, quick couple slides on uh, urolithiasis during pregnancy. Epidemiology, stone rates occur at the same rate as in the general public. The majority of stones occur in the second and third trimesters, and 70 to 80% of calculi will pass spontaneously. How to diagnose? First choice is ultrasonography. You can also use a limited IVP, which is a scout, a single uh, delayed film, at, I'm sorry, one film at 15 to 20 minutes, and then perhaps a, another delayed film uh, later than that. How do you manage these patients? As I already mentioned, conservative is uh, number one. 
Uh, you try to avoid NSAIDs because of the risk of pulmonary hypertension, premature closure of the fetal uh, ductus arteriosus. Indications for treatment, infected hydronephrosis or sepsis, solitary kidney or bilateral obstruction, unremitting pain. Treat, you can stent or perk, should be placed under ultrasound guidance and you need to change um, the stent or the perk every four to six weeks because of the risk of incrustation. Ureteroscopy can be used to treat a pregnant um, uh, patient. Ultrasound guidance is used for wire placement and passage of your stent. The homeum laser is the preferred lithotripe. One slide on open surgery, which uh, doesn't occur very re um, often. In 2000, only 2% 2 of the Medicare patients treated for stones undergo open stone surgery. Tertiary medical centers report less than a 1% of patients undergoing surgery have an open approach. The indications, large stones, complex collecting systems with narrowed infundibulum, excessive morbidly obese patients, and in the, if you have a patient who has stones and an extremely poor functioning kidney, then nephrectomy is reasonable. Question nine, a woman is in her eighth week of pregnancy, has right flank pain, ultrasound demonstrates a five millimeter right UPJ calculus, urine culture is negative, the next step is, yeah. 60 to 80% of women with ureteral colic will spontaneously pass their calculi with hydration analgesic therapy. If conservative therapy fails, a ureteral stent should be placed cystoscopically with sonography or minimal uh, radiographic imaging. Pregnancy is an absolute contraindication for the use of shockwave. Last question, a pregnant woman has a ureteral calculus causing pain. She's failed observation and cannot tolerate a ureteral stent. The best definitive management is, so ureteroscopy is obviously one of the choices. What's your lithotrite, EHL, laser, or ultrasound? So when intervention is indicated, ureteroscopy using homeum laser may be safely performed. The peak pressures from EHL are transmitted beyond the probe, leading to concerns about damage of the fetus. And ultrasonic lithotripsy has the theoretical concern of damage to fetal hearing. So in summary, small asymptomatic renal calculi can be observed up to one centimeter in the lower pole. Ureteral stones less than a centimeter should undergo a period of observation along with expulsive therapy. Ureteroscopy is more effective than shockwave for ureteral calculi especially for stones greater than a centimeter. <laughs> Ureteroscopy or shockwave for symptomatic lower pole stones less than a centimeter. Shockwave is not indicated for lower pole stones greater than a centimeter. And the renal stone burden greater than two centimeters, PERC is first line therapy in adults. PERC or shockwave is reasonable in the pediatric patient. Thank you. <laughs>